Welcome to Praxis. I'm Olivia Rousset. I'd like to welcome our audience here in Sydney, as well as people watching us on APAC and online, and a special welcome to our friends in Papua New Guinea who are joining us today. Today we're discussing microfinance in the developing world. On our panel is Guy Winship, who's the CEO of Good Return and the Director of World Education Australia. We also have Terry Reid, the Legal Reforms Advisor from the Asian Development Bank and a member of the Pacific Private Sector Development Team, and John Conroy, who is a special consultant with the Foundation for Development Cooperation. The very poor have always had extremely limited access to financial services in developing countries. Without the collateral to secure loans from banks, those in need of money must rely on handouts or onerous loans from informal moneylenders. Microcredit was developed to specifically help these people. The idea is that very small loans, by Western standards, can make a disproportionate difference to a person in a developing economy. In 1976, a Bangladeshi economist made the first microcredit loan from his own pocket. Muhammad Yunus lent 27 US dollars to a group of 42 women in the village of Jobra so that they could buy the material they needed to make bamboo furniture. The loan was repaid in full and each of the women made a two cent profit. While this doesn't seem like much, it made a profound difference in the lives of the women concerned who would have otherwise had to secure exorbitant interest loans from a local moneylender just to break even. Muhammad Yunus went on to form the Grameen Bank and, with others, developed the idea of microcredit into microfinance, a range of financial services designed to help the poor and vulnerable. In addition to credit, these services include savings accounts, money transfer and microinsurance. Most microfinance programs are targeted at women, as they're the most financially marginalised in developing countries. Studies also show that women tend to use their income to provide food for the family and pay for the children's education. Microfinance has taken a strong hold throughout Asia, assisted by the economies of scale in countries such as India and Bangladesh, and to a lesser degree in Latin America and other developing countries. It's moved from being largely funded by NGOs to being run as a financially sustainable enterprise by both governments and the commercial sector. This commercially sustainable microfinance is relatively new to the Pacific. A recent study done by the United Nations, the European Investment Bank, and the International Finance Corporation found that around 80% of Papua New Guinea's adult population don't use formal financial services, largely due to remoteness, access to services, and a lack of financial literacy. While it may not be the miracle cure for poverty it's often touted as being, microfinance could have a dramatic impact on PNG's future development by giving the people the opportunity to start or grow businesses. Throughout the discussion today, I'll invite questions from the audience. Our first speaker is Guy Winship. Guy has extensive field experience in running microfinance programs all over Asia and Africa, as well as practice in making microfinance operations commercially sustainable. Guy, can you tell us why it's important for microfinance to be commercially sustainable? There are perhaps 4 billion low-income people in the world today, people living on less than $2 a day, and perhaps one and a half billion of them don't have access to financial services. And the only way in which the sector and the world is going to be able to provide those services to them over time is to be able to provide it in a financially sustainable way. And perhaps for some people that's surprising, low income people can cover the costs of the provision of that service. Um, one of the things that was interesting is the largest funded uh, uh, foundation in the world, you might be interested to know, is the Gates Foundation. It's got around $60 billion in, of, in, of, of, of uh, endowment. And there's, if we had take 4 billion low-income people in the world, if you took that uh, $60 billion and gave it out to those 4 billion people, it would be $15 to every one of those people. And what would you do the second week? So providing financial services on a sustainable basis is the only way that we're going to be able to provide those services over time and to millions and millions of people. That's the only way that um, it's going to be possible is to work with financially sustainable institutions. Just to say that it's not only commercial institutions. We're talking about a range of different types of institutions that provide these financial services to low-income folk. Um, then they range from for-profit to not-for-profit groups, uh, from membership-based groups like credit unions to large 
um, commercial banks that provide services to, to low-income people. Grameen Bank is, is, one foundation, uh, is, is, is one example, but there's examples all over the world of these financial institutions. Um, just to stress also that people uh, don't, low-income folk don't only need credit services. Credit is an important service, the ability to get a loan um, so that you can invest in productive activities. But saving services are, are critical, a critical service for low-income folk. What do most low-income people do in Asia? Farmers. And most of those farmers in Asia are rice farmers. They get a harvest, perhaps once a year, in some cases twice a year. They're still on $2 a day. That's perhaps 700 and, if we say 750 US dollars a year. They get it in a lump sum. What do they do with that money? They invest it in, a, in an animal or in jewelry. And there's a whole range of risks around, around, around that. If you invest in a, in a buffalo, it's not divisible. If your child needs $10 for quinine tablets, you can't sell that $100 buffalo, you know, take $10, cut off the leg, and, and, and take, a little, take $10 for that, that quinine tablet. So saving services, um, uh, in my experience, and in most of the studies that have been done in the sector, indicate that poor people, generally, they're the, the service that they require the most is, is in fact, saving services. Mm -hmm. Saving services followed by credit services, followed by insurance and payment and, and other financial, financial services. So as opposed to credit, what, what needs to be set up for the saving services? Why, why what's in the way All of right. them? That's uh, a, a good perspective. From the perspective of you or I or a very low income person, when somebody gives me a loan, then the bank takes the risk. When I am uh, someone who is investing, putting my savings, my hard-earned savings, that I, as a low-income person, is much more vulnerable to economic shocks, I need to trust the bank. And so consumer protection measures, look at the global financial crisis, some of the great, our great investment banks in the United States that have failed, um, and some in, in, in our region as well. So once an organization is providing those saving services, consumer protection measures and regulation become much more, much more important. Um, and as a source of capital, savings uh, is, is an important source of capital for those institutions. But the consumer protection, protecting poor people's savings, should and is a, of primary concern to all the practitioners, um, my colleagues, to most importantly to the poor people who are putting their hard-earned savings in those institutions. So having institutions that are financially sustainable Coming back to your first question, mm. institutions that are financially sustainable that do not start seeking that person's hard-earned savings to pay off bad loans is critical. So regulation and protection of those savings, those, those, those low-income um, assets is critical. Why, aren't there, why can't poor people today say where, where microfinance hasn't been set up, why can't they take their money to a bank, their, their 50 cents a month and, and invest it in, and put it in a savings account now? That's, um, there's a number of reasons. Um, all financial institutions, all, all banks certainly face three types of costs. Um, cost of risk when they're lending, uh, transaction costs, the, the cost per unit dollar of lending to a rural farmer, 500 or $1,000 is of course higher than Westpac providing a million dollar loan to a, to a business person, the, the cost per dollar lend. And the third is around the cost of capital. Um, and for a traditional commercial bank to provide those services to a low-income person, to a rural farmer who doesn't have collateral to offer, doesn't have a track record, is very difficult. So new strategies, new methodologies, new approaches um, have evolved in the microfinance sector to overcome those, those different costs. The most common one, of course, is the use of group methodologies, which overcomes risk because there's collateral. Uh, peer collateral rather than traditional asset-based collateral. And the second is that it it's overcomes one of the challenges of uh, the unit uh, of transaction costs, that it lowers the, the unit price. And that's one of the things that um, has become, um, the microfinance sector has become known for. And traditional banks typically don't follow that kind of uh, methodology. Dare I say that uh, in my experience, there is also... Um, cultural and other factors. Having someone who can't read very well, perhaps has dirt under their nails from being a farmer, who comes into the bank office, um, the white collar 
worker in, in the bank doesn't always welcome those people. And there's, in many countries that we work in, um, social and cultural factors uh, create a barrier. Um, and there's many other reasons why traditional banks um, don't or can't provide those, those services. Well, if I could just add, I mean, there just isn't a bank. If you think about the Pacific, where there are so many you know, islands, there just isn't a bank. Uh, so you've got to provide some sort of alternative way of uh, people creating savings. So apart from the apart from the cost of risk and of lending and perhaps in in charges for savings accounts, there's just the structure that needs to be set up and the understanding of from both sides of the need. Ab absolutely, um, there needs to be an institutional platform, an institutional foundation that provides that institution. In Australia, we have Westpac, we have Commonwealth Bank, we have a whole range of financial institutions. Those institutions, as Terry says, are not always available in, the, in developing countries or in, or in the Pacific. Um, there's a lot of barriers to, having a, 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 to getting a bank license. Um, there's regulation barriers, there's capital barriers, there's skill barriers. How do you assess risk? And so getting a structured uh, team together um, it creates a whole lot of barriers. Skills is, is perhaps one of the largest barriers for those institutions to be able to provide those, those services. Think about risk, think about board governance, think about compliance and risk management. Mm. Guy, could you bring it down to, a, to let's talk about on the, on the, on the ground, what, with the different services available um, in the umbrella of microfinance, what would the needs be, say, examples of needs be in, for savings, for credit, for microinsurance? those kinds of things. I gave the example of a rural farmer, a rural rice mm -hmm. farmer who needs to save that $700 um, and then their expenses, um, they have regular expenses but they only get the income once, once a year, un unlike many people in, in, in this room. But um, for, so that's on the saving side, but if I take on the, on the investment side, um, we have for example um, a woman who um, um, has wants to uh, provide um, a business for herself. She's, she's um, perhaps making school uniforms for her local, the local school that her children are going, going to. She needs $300 or $400 for a sewing machine. And she needs another $100 for the working capital. And when you're living on $2 a day, trying to get four or $500 in capital together to be able to make that investment in a sewing machine is very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, think about it as simply as buying this pen for $1 and selling it for $2, and then buying a pen for two, two pens for $2 and selling it for $4. If someone gave you $100, assuming that there's a market for that and that you have the skills to undertake that business, well, if someone gave you $100, you could buy the 100 pens and sell 200 pens and you're in business. Mm -hmm. So access to capital is, 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 a, is, is a major barrier for many people. Well, we might um, move on to our next speaker, Terry Reid, um, and talk about some of the frameworks that need to be set up before microfinance can be put into operation. Terry is a lawyer and has worked throughout Asia looking at regulation in the financial sector. And for the past five years, his focus has been in the Pacific. Terry, can you tell me what the Asian Development Bank has been doing in the region? Sure. And well, the Asian Development Bank has been supporting a number of initiatives that are aimed not only at microfinance, but the provision of finance or financial services generally. Because I think if we look at the Pacific, we find that microfinance is certainly in its infancy. There's a long, long way to go with it. Um, in, for example, the Solomon Islands, it's almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet the demand for finance, the demand for financial services is huge. So we have um, specific microfinance interventions, for example, um, uh, institutional support to some of the, the larger microfinance institutions in countries, for example, the National Bank of Vanuatu, uh, also in PNG and Timor-Leste with IMFTL, we're providing institutional support. Uh, we're also in um, PNG and uh, Timor-Leste looking at um, mobile phone technology and, um, and branchless banking, which goes once again to the point the guy was making before about accessibility to banking services, etc. We're also providing some support for um, financial education, capacity building through those institutions throughout the Pacific. And through our um, private sector development initiative, we are supporting a number of legal reforms, which is where my involvement comes in, at trying to open up or create an environment that is particularly accessible and low cost for all, for all people to use um, in terms of accessing uh, finance. And I guess one particular area where we're looking at that is in the um, 
secure transactions laws, which we're, we're introducing to a number of Pacific countries, which will enable um, individuals that might currently be using a, a microfinance uh, institution to actually use their assets um, and perhaps gain an asset or, or get an, a loan against those assets. So they might take their, their sewing machine or they might take the school uniforms that they're actually um, making, they might use their, their canoe, their fishing canoe, um, whatever, their, whatever assets they have, then they're able to use those assets in, in which they can then um, get some sort of financing. So we're trying to make that as simple as possible. So removing um, in the new laws that are introduced the whole raft of problems that you find in all of these countries throughout the Pacific, you get uh, discretion, that uh, ministerial and administrative discretion that prevents people from um, accessing these services. You get a whole lot of problems around um, pure discrimination, particularly with women. I think women are the most disadvantaged group when it comes to, to trying to access these services through current laws and overall a, a, a much, much lower transaction cost. So that you should be able to go to a financial institution with here's my asset or my ownership certificate and, 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 and get some finance uh, around that. And we're trying to do that um, across the region. So there are a number of laws we've introduced, for example, in, in Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, the, the Marshall Islands, uh, Federated States of Micronesia. We're looking at introducing laws in, in Tonga, in, in PNG currently, and, um, and, and Palau. So there's, there's a lot of that, even though they're in laws for individual countries, there's a real regional approach to it. And with all of those new laws comes automation. And the beauty of automation is that it creates an opportunity as um, telecommunications networks become more sophisticated in these countries for people in um, rural areas and small villages to actually access um, some of these services. I mean, one of the fundamental problems that you find is that people want to grow their business. You know, for example, women can't leave the family. Um, they can't then afford to get to one of the main centres to, to, to work through the, the formal requirements of incorporating their business or, or, or going to see a bank. So um, those are, are some, of the, some of the initiatives anyway that ADB is involved in, um, in, in supporting to create a greater access to financial services in the Pacific. In, in places in Asia where, where microfinance has been very successful, you've got a very dense population. Mm. You've got people who have good access to banks or post offices or other places um, to, to deal with their finances. The Pacific is so broadly mm. spread. Can you talk a bit more to some of the other problems that people face and perhaps give an example of, of how you're proposing that they go about getting around those, those problems? Well, you know, the fact is that, as you say, everybody is spread out and there's hundreds of different islands that need to be covered. But I think if you look at, for example, um, an institution that is very successful in Vanuatu, which is, which is Van Woods, which is a charitable association which supports, um, has women members and supports, uh, you know, microfinance uh, and has grown quite significantly, they have particularly powerful networks through the islands. And so that structure in itself, we... Uh, if we're looking at introducing reforms, you need to tap into those types of networks. And, and I think there's, um, you know, one of the, I guess one of the big risks that you run is that you develop some sort of new legal framework and nobody knows how to use it, right? So that you have to make sure that it's sufficiently user-friendly and can actually get into those, into those areas. I think that certainly telecommunications, um, mobile technology is going to have a ma and is having a major impact in connecting those those rural areas and those the, the, the white dealing with that geographical problem. Teachers getting salaries don't have to go into main centres now. They can check on their mobile phone and they can access it in that way. So that and I see a great growth in that. And we're doing quite a lot of work mm. to support the introduction of those technologies. Are there other issues uh, in the Pacific uh, like ownership? You talk about people being able to use, say, their boat or their car as mm. collateral. But what about if it's land owned by a village or? Yeah, I mean, those are, the land is a difficult, difficult one to deal with, and collective ownership and customary issues that arise. We, are, we have actually been looking at the introduction of some different types of entities that will support the use of um, collective ownership of assets to access finance. Um, and that's, um, for example, in the Solomon Islands in Vanuatu, we've been working a lot with um, um, 
both private and public sector to design an entity which, is, which has been called a community company, which, which will allow community groups to pool their assets and to safeguard those assets, um, but actually use those to access finance. So there are lots of restrictions around the operation of those entities, but we have to try and there seems to be a really big demand, as you say, for tapping into those collectively owned assets. Um, and what's been your biggest challenge with regulation in, in the region? I guess the biggest, the biggest challenge is to, is to try and uh, have laws that are there as supports and actually don't get in the way of what you're actually trying to provide. Um, so you have to make sure that the laws eliminate as far as possible discretion um, and transaction costs because at every step somebody wants to get in and get their, you know, um, their, their payment and we have to eliminate that. And I think that particularly in the Pacific you have to try and get in, around implementation of these laws, you must be able to reach each group. Um, and the work that we do with, with women's groups, you know, we, we try and do that by way of uh, radio and, and also, you know, any mechanism that is available, um, the structures, the community structures that are in place to try and explain um, how to use these services. Mm. Um, so I think that's, the, that's always a key challenge is actually being able to develop a law that is going to be used mm. and is particularly cheap to use. Do you look to put a cap on insurance on interest charged? Is there because you know there are some cases of you know, I've read certain cases of people charging as much as a hundred percent interest or, or you know more commonly mm. high interest being around 70 80 percent. Mm. Um, it's on average is it around 15 percent? I think you need to ask or? one of the economists. That okay. Um, the lawyers can do anything um, but the economists uh, make those decisions about what we do. You dream they are. <laughs> I don't know where the guy wants to come Well, in. interest rates is a, is, is a whole topic on its own. Certainly the transaction costs, as I mentioned, are higher per unit dollar lent. To do a $500 loan, uh, I mean, I know my, the, the loan I got from a local financial institution, they had a standard $600 fee. Well, if I'm only borrowing $400, that's, that's pretty high as a percentage. And um, so the costs are higher. I mentioned, um, and it's certainly central to, to the programs that we, we work on, is the, the financial institutions that are providing the credit uh, need to be able to manage risk and assess risks and to provide services efficiently so that they can pass on those efficiencies in lower interest rates to clients. Yeah. Um, um, are we comparing the interest rate with a commercial bank? Um, well, the commercial banks are not providing that, that service in those communities. We perhaps should, should uh, compare the interest rate with a local village money lender that's charging perhaps 50% uh, a week or 200% mm -hmm. a month. Um, what, what is, a, a, an, a, is there such thing as an average? Or what are we talking about when we talk about interest for? There isn't. Um, typically, um, I think a local commercial bank rate plus 10 or 15% would be acceptable. Flat. This is a whole... Flat. Not diminishing. Okay, that's. Can you explain that? What do you mean by flat not diminishing? Oh well, you know, it it it, it you continue to pay uh, at that rate even if you've paid off practically every dollar of the loan. It's but not a diminishing agree. balance loan. So in fact, uh, on a, in effective terms, the rates can be extremely high. Now that is still defensible. Uh, if um, the benefit which is being done to the person who receives the loan uh, uh, is, is adequate. It is observable that people do manage to service these loans which bear very high rates of interest. Um, and in relation to high rates of interest, I'll have something to say later. Perhaps we should, we should move on to, um, to John. Um, John has lived and worked in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea for extended periods. Up in noon, or get along Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and today, John will be talking about microfinance and international development. Thank you. But first I want to go right back to the basics. Um, microcredit, the extension of very small loans to very poor people. Um, now, a hot a, a subject of raging controversy within microfinance circles as to what, what the real impact is, whether it's overdone the hype, whether it really is doing all the things it's supposed to be doing. Um, for example, those farmers, microcredit does nothing for farmers with an annual uh, lump sum income. It can only serve the needs of people with cash flow, constant 
small-scale petty trading activities. So immediately you're talking about a, a sub, subgroup of the whole population. Secondly, um, well, so microfinance is credit plus a range of other services, savings, remittances, which haven't been mentioned, even though there are five million Filipinos working all around the world, sending the money back home. How does it get back to the village? They need remittance services, um, payments services, uh, micro-insurance even. Now, um, in fact, I'll say that in Papua New Guinea, the demand for saving services by dollar volume is at least three or four times the volume of demand for credit in that country and in some other countries as well, in the Pacific more generally, I suspect. So this is a more nuanced, this is a more sophisticated view of the needs of the poor for financial services. But um, even microfinance is now seen in many ways to be in an inadequate concept. Nowadays, people are talking about the need to eliminate financial exclusion, the exclusion of not 80%, 90% of the population of Papua New Guinea from formal banking services, um, or what is called the financial inclusion approach. I predict that in another 10 or 15 years, microfinance will be an historical curiosity, whereas there will still be a tremendous need to combat financial exclusion. After all, there are about 40 million Americans without bank accounts, and they haven't solved the problem, and that's the wealthiest country in the world. So um, a financial inclusion approach, which also turns our attention to the building of financial systems and making them work better. Microloans given out by uh, charitable institutions, and even if returned and given out again, is not doing much to create that broader financial system which is capable of serving the needs of the poor. So Tell me about how the approach has changed then internationally. To... Well, internationally I think there are some uh, encouraging signs. The G20, amongst other things, in tearing its hair about the global financial crisis, still managed in the course of that communique last year to issue a statement committing to adopt financial inclusion as a matter of policy, as an anti-poverty measure. They've established a G20 financial inclusion experts group chaired, I'm pleased to say, by an Australian, even more pleased to say, to say that it's being chaired by a Treasury person. So as a Treasury person, one expects a systems approach, a financial systems approach to be adopted, which is the right way to go. And I think that this recognition by world leaders of the 20 most important economies in the world is a very encouraging sign. John, as far as sort of practicalities on the, on the ground for financial yeah. inclusion, what, what is needed? What's involved? Obviously there's education element to it on this side for the Well, there are two things. You've got all these gra grassroots level institutions which emerge from the voluntary sector, NGOs and all that. Mm -hmm. They have to professionalise themselves and accept the cultural changes required in being hard, tough-minded about, about dealing with people and money. So they have to grow up to embrace more and more of the understories of poverty. Uh, at the top you have the formal financial institutions. They have to be capable of scaling down and, and adopting, learning from what's sometimes called the microfinance revolution, learning about the techniques and technologies of reaching those people at, at the lower levels. And it's not just the poor, by the way, who are financially excluded. A lot of middle class people, quite well-to-do people, are still excluded in many countries. But that's not our focus just today, or shouldn't be our our focus today. Okay. So what, what, what can, what can Asia-Pacific governments get better at doing? Well, um, uh, the Asia-Pacific region, Asia, teeming masses, economies of scale because of those teeming masses, Pacific, sparse, dispersed populations, diseconomies of scale and of distance and so on. So it's very hard to, to put them in the same basket and talk about them. In Asia, you see some of the absolutely best examples of um, microfinance practice. By the way, I should say one important thing. Difference between microfinance and financial exclusion. Microfinance is a policy instrument. Financial exclusion is a policy goal. The goal goes on. Financial while inclusion. The, yeah. Yeah, well, 
the elimination of financial exclusion mm -hmm. is the policy goal. Mm -hmm. That goal will continue to be relevant in 50 or a, alas, I suspect, 100 years. Mm -hmm. Microfinance, as I said, will have been confined to the, the bookshelves and master's theses and so on. With financial literacy, because a lot of people, would, based on the history of, of donors and NGOs operating these things, suddenly people may not be aware of what's at stake and, and what they're signing up for. Well, we see plenty of evidence of financial illiteracy. One only has to see the interviews of the latest people who have been uh, ruined by your storm financials and so on to realise that financial illiteracy is, is a besetting sin in, in, in every economy. Um, it, the more so when people are uh, uh, inhibited by lack of education or custom or caste or whatever from um, understanding what's happening to them. But I wanted to actually to talk about uh, the international aspects, because that mm -hmm. is my brief to talk about the international aspects. And um, it's very interesting. There is at the moment a new phenomenon occurring, which is a, 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 a tremendous increase in the amount of capital resources which are, which are being made available to poor countries f to support uh, the microfinance industry. And in fact, we have at the end of 2008, uh, the total commitments by aid donors, uh, by granting institutions, and by private investors. Private investors, by the way, the largest group among that. Total commitments made $15 billion of foreign capital moving into poor countries to fund microfinance. Mm -hmm. Now, you might think this is a good thing, but the question to ask is, does this availability of uh, relatively abundant funding from rich countries Actually, the original source of that is China, but never mind. It flows into the rich countries and then flows back into poor countries. That, if you like irony, that's a nice, nice little one, isn't it? Um, the, um, uh, does this abundance of capital from rich countries disinhibit, or no, sorry, inhibit, inhibit, uh, disincline financial institutions to go to the hard labour of mobilising savings from their own community? Mm -hmm. could, I, could I just add, uh, I think that um, there's, there's, there is the potential of, of, of too much capital um, pushing out savings, as, as John said. But I think from a, an end user, from the beneficiary, the client point of view, there's the danger of having to push out that capital in the form of, of these millions and millions of, of loans and creating indebtedness. And I mentioned around mm -hmm. consumer protection, ultimately providing education services, people understanding the differences between the flat interest rate versus uh, effective interest rates, what it's really costing you to access that money. What would happen if you don't, don't repay? What legal provisions do, do you have? And understanding um, what it means to get into debt um, is, is, is a danger that we need to be, to be aware of. Mm. Well, um, I, I'd like to pursue, pursue that, that theme um, because uh, I, I, I am quite ambivalent about this uh, very substantial amount of funding. This is, this is capital. This is not aid which is going to build up the human capacities, institutional development, uh, um, or even to finance financial literacy programs or anything like this. This is uh, capital. Uh, the, major the great majority of it, three quarters of it, is in, is in some sense repayable. 52% uh, of this $15 billion I referred to is investment capital. Some of those investors are so-called social investors who accept uh, modest rates of return. But you see, what else is happening is that just before the financial crisis, Wall Street and the city read about the huge interest rates which microcredit borrowers will pay in poor countries. And they decided, we've got to get a piece of this. Microcredit lending, micro lending has become an asset class for fund managers in <coughs> Wall Street and the city. And um, this, is a, this is a very disturbing thing. Uh, uh, there, there, are, there, are, there are a couple of downsides to that. First of all, it's the, the, the business of disinclining the microfinance institutions to do the hard work of learning to mobilise savings, investing in, in the human resources that are required to do so, and in the process building a grassroots financial system. No, it's easy. Just get the money from outside and just channel it back to outside. 
and it doesn't, it, there's no financial intermediation going on in that grassroots financial system. The other thing is that if you find that a private equity company has purchased a 15 or 25 percent in stake in your microfinance institution, then they're going to exert pressure on you, subtle, maybe not so subtle, for higher and higher returns. And then this leads to the phenomenon known as mission drift. We started off wearing uh, 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 white cotton garments uh, and, and serving the poor, but now we find ourselves under pressure to raise the returns, so we think, well, we'll just move up to a slightly better class of borrower, uh, because there are still plenty of uh, middle-income people who are excluded, so we'll lend to them for refrigerators and TVs and even, and even the new $3,000 Indian car. Um, and this mission drift is in grave danger of leaving, leaving the poor behind. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, policy in the international community and in uh, individual developing countries has to comprehend the implications of this, these changes which are occurring, uh, that when micro-lending and the excessive... By the way, they all call themselves microfinance investors. But they're not investing in microfinance. They have no interest in mobilising the savings of the poor and providing that service. They want to lend to these people. It's micro-lending investment. And I think that's a very disturbing thing which policy at the international and national levels has to concern itself with. Thank you. At this point, I'll open it up for questions. Does anyone? It's on. Hi, Ryan from Opportunity National and uh, Ayani Consultants. I'd like to take up this discussion because this is a very interesting one and perhaps uh, propose a counter view to what John has said. I mean, I, I agree that there is this whole issue of mission drift at the moment and there are some investors going into microfinance for perhaps the wrong reasons. But Opportunity National, I mean, we have 40 institutions and we've transformed 15 of them into deposit-taking institutions for all the reasons that John mentioned. But one of the issues is that in a lot of countries, for example, Russia, and Colombia, the minimum capital you need to be a deposit-taking institution is $10 million in those two countries, and it can be very high in many countries. So uh, utilising the savings and using that as a form of capital is fine, but in the short term there really is a need for microfinance institutions to be capitalised, but it can be done in a way, as Opportunity National would, uh, would say, without mission drift. So I think the capital is important, uh, but you need to keep an eye on the mission drift at the same time. Thank you. Well, I, I suppose then we should turn to the legal expert and ask him to have a look at the Banking Act in those two countries and uh, uh, see whether, in fact, um, uh, uh, there is scope for um, uh, modest forms of experimentation in uh, allowing limited banking licenses for deposit-taking institutions, having adequate capital adequacy norms for them, and uh, encouraging, as is being done in Papua New Guinea, for example, where they have limited banking licenses for a couple of, of micro-banks there. And the Bank of Papua New Guinea has been quite proactive in uh, experimenting with, the, um, with the, the banking law. And indeed, uh, the Basel uh, authorities uh, in, in Switzerland are, uh, are issuing um, uh, or conducting uh, public consultations on depository, on guidelines for depository, micro-depository institutions, something has to be done. If that's, if that's a, a regulatory barrier, well, it has to be examined. But uh, uh, I, I'm glad that you're not, not denying the example of scandals and bubbles occurring in a number of countries, uh, and some of them not too far away from here as a result of, the, of uh, investment in micro-lending. Just to add to that, uh, I think that the, it's the very much a balancing exercise, isn't it, in terms of making sure that there are sufficient protections in place but not discouraging the growth of these financial institutions. And, and certainly in the Pacific, if you look at uh, countries where there isn't, there might be some of these regulatory barriers, but it doesn't deter the formation of uh, um, savings and loans cooperatives at all. And in fact, there are hundreds and hundreds of them that exist um, sort of outside of this more formal regulatory framework. And I think we need to address how we as assist those types of entity because I think they have a real place in the Pacific. Um, and the greater regulation you provide, the, the less of them that, that will exist. And I think we need to think about that. It's a very difficult area because savings and 
credit unions, savings and loans, cooperatives and so on, have a very checkered history in the region and uh, they fall over and they're propped up again, they fall over and they're propped up again. And um, uh, uh, it, it is, it, it's institution building and, and it's extraordinarily uh, difficult to do. Yeah, just one of the things that I'd, I'd aspire to in terms of financial inclusion is when there are many institutions that a low-income person has access to for saving services and credit services, that ultimately that would help to, that choice uh, is to vote with your feet and to go where there's better services and cheaper services. And ultimately that's something that is a part of the solution. Um, um, and that th there's many ways in which uh, to... to uh, to get there, um, regulatory, um, party capital, um, but but ultimately having a competitive microfinance envi environment, I think, has to be a goal for for all of us. Are there, is there anything being set up along the lines of financial literacy and education, so that when, say, there are several lenders coming into the market and they're going to start lobbying for customers, are there education programs being put in place to protect people, to give them an understanding of what? they're signing up for? Central to, to the work that we do is to provide uh, access to financial services, but alongside that is the technical and the knowledge that it takes to understand um, what to do with a loan, where to save, why to save, budgeting, the skills that it takes to run a business, the skills that it takes to run a household budget, um, um, the skills and the professionalism of, of, of the intermediate organizations, the microfinance institutions. So. Um, Absolutely, for us, uh, uh, loans without financial to financially illiterate people it can just create levels of indebtedness and, mm. and misunderstandings. The, the, and I would argue that it's uh, it's not um, um, it's, it's, it, it wouldn't be um, ethical to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that the um, the most effective form of financial literacy education is the possession of a savings deposit account and the careful and uh, grafting, grifting uh, acqu uh, accumulation over time of small periodic sums of money. That's, that's a major exercise in financial, in the development of financial literacy. Well, just to add to that, most financial institutions, many financial institutions, in fact, their programmatic outlook is to start people saving 10 cents a week or 20 cents a week and to get used to the relationship and the, the, and the discipline of that before they, in fact, are able to, to access a loan. So that's a very common methodological approach. Might take some more questions from the floor if there are any here. Does anyone else have a question? My name is Arjun Bisson. I'm a researcher um, from UTS. I just completed my thesis. Um, you've mentioned many of the negative impacts of, um, that can occur due to extreme commercialization and um, examples in Latin America of banks rorting the poor. Um, what can be done in Asia Pacific in terms of social performance measurement to ensure that clients are being uh, well taken care of and their uh, lifestyle is improving as a result of um, microfinance? Who would like to take that one up? Uh, I tend to be a bit of a fascist in this regard. Um, uh, what are we doing? We're providing financial services. Let's provide financial services to the poor. Let's provide the financial services that they need and which they will vote for by returning again and again to use. Let somebody else measure the social impact as far as I'm concerned. Provide the services which demonstrably the poor need and, and appreciate. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly important issue. I think everyone gets very excited about um solutions but the, the practicalities are much more complicated. But, um, could well, you... Maybe, yeah, if I just add yeah. to that, just certainly in the small area that I'm involved in, clearly if you're, if you're um, supporting the introduction of a new law you need to go back and you need to evaluate it and I think that the Asian Development Bank has quite introduced a very rigorous monitoring and evaluation framework that allows us to go back and see whether or not the objectives that the, the policy makers have with regard to these laws are actually working. Um, and at a gra from a grassroots level up. So uh, just in a small part of it we need to evaluate and we need to make changes um, if, that, if that's what's demanded. Mm. I, I think there is, there is great scope for microfinance institutions to be subject to uh, uh, consumer protection legislation, but perhaps even more important is their 
uh, uh, forms of self-regulation and the organization of networks of microfinance institutions within national economies and as between other sorts of economies. There are, for example, the two uh, microfinance networks, uh, Banking with the Poor, established in 1991 by the Foundation for Development Cooperation, which is the Asian regional network of microfinance institutions and central banks and other stakeholders. And more recently in the Pacific, Microfinance Pacifica, also established by the Foundation for Development Cooperation, which brings together the stakeholders from those uh, very different and, and much smaller countries. Now, um, partly it's a result of getting the microfinance institutions to accept uh, standards of behaviour. Uh, if they voluntarily and by consensus if they will or legislatively if necessary to do so. And microfinance networks play a very important role in that process. I agree with that. I think that the, the whole problem with consumer protection is access to institutional institutions and institutional capacity, certainly in the Pacific. So you have to design something that can be used by the people that actually need to use it. Um, traditional models that we might have in Australia or New Zealand just, just won't work, uh, in my view. And in terms of product placement, um, I, I was hoping to draw to your attention, if you're interested in some of my, my more iconoclastic ideas, my paper on microcredit as a form of subprime lending uh, is freely available here. I think we have another question over here. Uh, it's Jack Whelan from the Foundation for Development Cooperation. So building on what John has just described on the development of these networks of microfinance institutions, from what everybody's been saying today, it sounds to me like there's a, a greater need for capacity building and institution building amongst the MFI uh, community. What are the three organisations actually doing in a practical sense out there on the ground in order to come face to face with MFIs and build their capacity that's needed? Um, I, I, I'm not John. Um, I have less faith in self-regulation. Uh, especially in, in savings mobilization. Um, and we can certainly talk more about, about that. I don't, I don't think self-regulation is, is, is the answer or, or associations. I think there's a lot of other roles for associations, but it's not in, 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 in con necessarily uh, in, in regulation. Um, just to say my own organization, perhaps um, the best known program is Good Return. It's, it's, uh, everyone can have a look at it, www.goodreturn.org. It offers the opportunity for anyone around the world to lend $25 to someone in a developing country. Uh, those, those amounts are put together and, and sent overseas. Um, but the other two legs of the program um, is what, of course, I've been plugging home, is providing technical assistance to those microfinance institutions so that they are a more efficient and um, professional organizations. They are better able to be compliant with regulations. They're better able to, to meet client needs, those, those low-income people's needs. And very importantly, they're able to pass on those efficiencies and lower interest rates. Um, the defense of interest rates has typically been, well, we need to cover costs. Well, if your costs are really inefficient and you're not able to manage risk well, then you're passing on those inefficiencies by higher interest rates. So professionalizing those organizations is central to, to providing a better service. And we use that, that, that capital as a way to partner with those organizations to have the in, if you like. And the third leg of the program is around providing, through our 25 country offices, providing technical assistance and training to those end users, to those client beneficiaries from financial literacy through to vocational and technical skills, business skills and marketing skills. Um, uh, certainly my argument is, is that providing credit, as I've said, credit without skills is doing a disservice to people. It's a disservice. Um, I, and again, I want to stress that I can't uh, I completely take, take the point that John, John made. Saving services, believe it or believe it not, saving services are much more important for poor people than credit services. So a lot of people talk to me, say to me, no, you're in microcredit. <laughs> well, no, we, we do microfinance. And certainly, um, I, don't, I don't know, you know, anecdotally, I'd say that five or or, or eight times um, the partners that we have um, uh, and, and our clients have a, a five to eight, eight times a multiple in demand for saving services than they do for loan services. Um, so that's, that's incredibly important for, for low income people. But those are the three legs of our program. That's what we're doing about it. Terry, can you talk to that? Well, the ADB certainly supports um, uh, direct support for, for MFIs. Um, 
as I said before, a good example was uh, is National Bank of Vanuatu, which I think has been a, a huge success. I think John would agree with that uh, in terms of the support that ADB has provided. And um, we're doing this also in, in, in uh, PNG and also in Timor-Leste. This day in Vanuatu, we're looking at working with the government and the MFIs to put in place a, an, appropriately, uh, an appropriate regulatory framework that will uh, help protect and preserve the deposits because, as Guy say, that, that in fact is a, is a big concern now that these institutions, particularly uh, in Vanuatu, Vanwards has substantial deposits and it's, an, it's important that we, we help work uh, with them to, to protect those deposits. So direct technical assistance and also at the policy level we're assisting governments in that regard. John, did Nobody you? said anything. Um, um, we've seen how hard it is. Uh, pro problems. If we say that the poor need saving services more than they need credit services, then you might say, well, then why, why don't all these little organisations, uh, why are they not permitted to accept savings from the poor? Mm. Well, precisely because they are the poor. This, you, if, the, if the widow gives, puts 20, has $25 in one of these little institutions, that's her capital. If this institution falls over or if the manager runs away, uh, that's a tremendous loss to that person. So uh, the difficulty is how, how, how to, f to bring safe, liquid deposit services close to the poor. And the thing that hasn't been mentioned so far is, is well, not much anyway, technology. I mean, uh, mobile phone banking, um, uh, which can even be, uh, can even be managed... Uh, uh, to, to accept deposits by, by making use of, of agencies and so on, or even the time on the phone is a form of savings. You buy the time. Maybe you can go to another city and pull your time out again. You've saved mm. that money. Of course, you've got to pay a commission for that, but if that commission's small enough, at least you've been able to move from one city to the other. Your phone might be stolen, of course, but... Uh, your well, that's, still a, that's a different problem. <laughs> <laughs> what about other examples, say in Papua New Guinea or, or places where things are set up with, with say, a business or a, 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 a coffee grower business or something like that? They, they're becoming sort of informal deposit institutions or lending institutions. Are, are they being brought into some kind of formal structure I, I or have they been brought in? I don't know much about, about that. Are there opportunities for that kind of thing? Well, I guess what we're trying to do in, is make the... the the formal economy less regulated to encourage the informal economy to move into yeah. that. And I think that um, through some of the work that we're doing, we, we, we're sort of making some progress in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I noticed, um, and I know there's a couple of larger banks that have a presence in the Pacific here today, so um, in terms of incentives often, I know in the Marshall Islands, the, when the new secure transactions law was passed, the banks provided an incentive, a reduced interest, interest rate for people that were using uh, movable property um, to 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 um, to support uh, borrowing and those types of things I think uh, uh, are all positives. But certainly making the, the informal economy uh, the formal economy less regulated is I think mm. the way to encourage that. Mm. And and I, we see that certainly moving around the Pacific that often people reach the the ceiling of what they can do in, within the microfinance sector and want to go beyond that. And you mm. see that a lot. And so mm. we must make sure that the, the, um, the formal economy is accessible in that regard. One thing we haven't talked about is, is microinsurance and the need for microinsurance or how it's used. Guy, can you talk a bit about that? Well, um, microinsurance, the pooling of risk, um, is possible. I think there's a lot of opportunities for microfinance institutions that are providing credit and saving services to hundreds of thousands of clients to... Um, to perhaps uh, low-income folk that have a level of financial literacy to offer them uh, property insurance, crop insurance, um, life and disability insurances um, at a very low unit cost because that institution can access a whole lot of people at a, at a, at a low cost. And the sector is starting to do more and more um, in, in, the, in, that, in that field. I would say that it's a fairly new sector for the, for the microfinance sector. Um, and there's also a lot of challenges in the developing countries in which we, we work in terms of the regulation of, mark, of, finance, of, ins, of insurance companies. Um, that is a layer, if I might say, a layer more than, than of the regular savings and credit, credit institutions. And there's very few insurance bodies there. One of the dangers is of the credit and savings institutions providing 
direct insurance services. So the model that I would very much promote is one where you're using you, that institution is providing an agent service to the insurance company rather than taking on the risk themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new business insurance. Mm -hmm. And so um, getting into that business is, is, mm -hmm. has challenges. There's one tremendous barrier. Um, in Papua New Guinea, for example, um, there are no life tables that can be relied on. The actuarially derived uh, uh, tables of expectation of life at age 29, 30, 31, and so on. So what insurer is going to give out life policies under those circumstances when you have no idea of the risks to which you're subjecting your shareholders? And in fact, interestingly, a, a few of the morbidity tables that we've worked with in, in Africa have been out of date really quickly as there's been uh, mm. HIV and AIDS has, has come through. It's mm. been... Uh, had a tremendous effect. It's a whole other topic, but we've run out of time. I'd like to thank the audience here and also in Port Moresby. Thank you to John Conroy, Terry Reid and Guy Winship. And hope you join us next month for the next Praxis. Thank you.